What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Don't forget, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, share the video. I know it's been a few days since we've done some interviews, so I figured the best way to get back with it is with uh, someone that we haven't interviewed before and, you know, bring on a native dude, a dude that spent a lot of time in prison. He's been a lot of places. He's been some places that people only talk about, but this man lived it. He experienced it, but I think it's better to let Lee tell you about who he is, where he's from, and kind of explain his situation, how he ended up in prison and some of the places he's been. What's up, Lee? Tell the people about you, man. Hey, what's up, Chad? First off, I'd like to say um, congratulations on your on your children, man. And, um, <laughs> you know, I wish you guys a good holiday season, man. And I appreciate what you're doing, getting the word out, you know, t talking about these injustices, letting people tell them stories, you know, try and help the youth out, man, so they ain't got to go through the same you know, bullshit that we went through, man. I but um, it. my name is uh, Leland Lord. I'm 39 years old. Um, um, I I had very, very good parents. You know what I mean? Um, they did it exactly how you're supposed to do it. Um, my dad was a sur uh, surveying engineer for the federal government. My mom was an art teacher at the school here on the reservation. You know, I'm the youngest of eight children. Um, we grew up pretty much uh, lower middle class, I'd say. Um, the, the reason I started doing what I was doing was just, I got, um, I don't know, I guess I was just attracted to the gangster mentality. And that's how I started out as a kid. You know what I mean? And no running the streets as a juvenile. I stayed locked up. You know, I was always getting trouble. I was stealing cars, you know, assaults, uh, underage drinking, stuff like that. Um, I probably did four years in juvenile. Um, I was gang banging out there. I went to the state prison here in Minnesota. Um, it's called Red Wing. You actually get your state prison number there. So I went there when I was 16. Got out of there when I was 18 years old. Um, it was in there when I kind of stopped gang banging. Um, the, I used to run with with the uh, renegade vice lords when I was a kid, and I just finally started looking, you know, through the literature and stuff like that, and you know, seeing that, you know, that really wasn't for me. You know, being a native, you know, a lot of the literature is um you know, based on kind of like five percenter type stuff like that. You know what I mean? So I fell back off of that, you know, um, but I was still doing the same shit. I was still around nothing but gangsters, you know what I mean? And um, at 18 years old, you know, I, I got out, I caught a drug case too at 18. So I was barely out every, you know, month here, month there. But I got out and at 18 years old, um, I caught a second degree murder and, um, for natives, the state, uh, the feds is pretty much our state joint, you know, just like the DC dudes, we don't necessarily have to have federal cases, you know, pretty much everything that we do, if it's a felony, the feds couldn't pick it up. You know what I'm saying? So the feds is pretty much our state joint, you know, and it's, it's fucked up because you got to do 85% of your time, you know, they keep, you know, mothers and fathers, you know, away from their family, like way far away from their family. I was never close to home the whole, the whole time I was in prison. Um, I got uh, 180 months for that, 15 years. I ended up doing over 16 because I caught more time while I was in there. Um, went to the, started out in USP Lee County. It was, um, it was, uh, it was actually for USP. It was pretty laid back, but I didn't know it at the time. Cause I ain't never been nowhere, but, let, um, let me ask you this. You were at help. USP Lee. What year was, were you at USP Lee? I went to USP Lee in, uh, Oh three. I was there from Oh three to Oh six. Um, I was there when they had their first body. Matter of fact, you talked about the dude not too long ago. He's on death row now. Carlo. Yeah, he's he stabbed the shit out of some dude on the yard over a hundred times and then he 
killed his celly in the shoe back there. You know, when I was in and out of the shoe, I'd be working out with him. He was a good dude, man. But um, yeah, I got a, I got into a bunch of shit over there, man. I was at the time I was uh I was always getting drunk and shit. You know, my first eight years, I was the wine man. So that's how I paid the bills and shit. You know what I'm saying? Um let's you, see. Let me ask you this. Were you at USP Lee when the arm dudes were there and they kicked that dude in the head with their boots? It was AJ and another dude. I think it might have been Chad yeah. and AJ. Yep. Yep. So you absolutely. were there when you were there when O'Brien was the warden? Yep, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Um yeah, it, I see. I seen a few things in Lee. Actually, I'm kind of glad I went there. I was blessed because um, I fell into a cell with um, with 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 a real good dude, man, older dude, older native dude. He laced me up real good. How to do time, you know? Because I was just young and wild, man. And you know, he did all my tats for me and stuff too. He, he he's the one who kind of got me into drawing, and then after that, tattooing and stuff. Um. But, uh, yeah, he laced me up, you know, how to be a man, because I was just a kid, man. And, you know, he, sh he showed me a lot of, a lot of the, you know, I was actually willing to listen. You know what I'm saying? And um, later on, I found out how blessed I was because I seen how many dudes, like, they'll take a youngster coming up, you know, they see that he got his heart and, he's, you know what I mean, he's, he's down for whatever. And a lot of older dudes will act like they're this and that to the dude, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're big shit in there. And then, you know, pretty much they just got themselves a torpedo and they'll fuck that young kid's life off, you know, just use that dude. But instead, man, he laced me up, you know what I mean? Tried to keep me out of trouble, try to keep a harness on me, you know? Like, he tried, but I was just too damn hard-headed, man. I was always getting into shit, you know? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I talk to you. Lee, I wanna talk to you about a couple things. We're gonna get into all that stuff. I don't want people to think that we're not, we are. But there's a few okay. things I want to talk to you about. I know you've been in the smooth program. You did four years straight in that special management unit locked in a cell. We're going to talk about some of that stuff. But I want to go back to you going to prison. You went to prison right. for, for a murder, right? Right. Can you talk yeah, a little um, bit about that? Yeah, I, I could speak more on that. I really don't. I ain't going to get into too much like details or nothing because, you know, my victim's family, I don't want them to have to, you know, you know, hear any about that, you know what I'm saying? I'm sure they're probably trying to forget about it and stuff like that. But yeah, it was a situation. I was with a couple of dudes, man, and we were getting drunk. And uh, one of my dudes told me like, hey, let's go over here. So-and-so owes me some bread, right? Um, If you don't pay me, you know what I'm saying? Let's fuck his ass up. And I was like, all right, let's do this. So we go over there. And uh, we kicked the door in and, you know, dude ain't even there. So we go in there and one person was there and that's who ended up getting killed. You know what I'm saying? And um, since I was there at the time and I witnessed it and I lied about it and I took him over state lines, tried to help him get away with it and all that shit. I was charged just like I did the shit myself. You know what I'm saying? So I got, that's, that's how I got, that's how that came about though. So I can tell, man, like from your story and talking to you briefly, are you remorseful? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the thing that I want to talk about is because you're 18 years old and it seems like you were easily influenced, we could say, right? By other people, you're a youngster. You're like, hey, I want to be cool. I want to be tough. Someone ends up dead and you end up in what, a 16 year sentence? 15. But 15. I ended up doing over 16 because I caught more time in prison. Yeah, we're going to get to that too. That was the riot with the oldness against the Native Americans, right? Yes. We're going to get there in a second. Um, All right. The reason why I ask you about that is because there's a lot of kids, man, watching this show. There might be some young men watching the show, 20, 22, 24, and maybe they're easily influenced. And some, you know, a bigger dude. Someone they look up to, maybe, you know, the drug dealer in their neighborhood, like, yo, man, what's up? This dude owes me some money, man. I want you guys to come hold me down. Let's go get this money. And look, look what ends up happening. Someone ends up dead. You end up with all this time in prison. And I want people to see that that's what happens, that those situations very, very seldom lead to good things, right? Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. That's the main reason I wanted to come on your show, you know, 
effort to re- try and reach out to the kids to show, you know, these kids on the reservation, just kids in general, you know, that, um, you know, it could happen to them, you know, because I was running the street, you know, doing the same shit they were doing, running the same streets they're running, man. And I'm living proof that, you know, it don't take much for shit to go haywire, man. Just takes one little mistake, man. Like, of course, you don't, you know, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't see it coming. You know, that was never the plan. But, you know, when you're living that life, hey, shit like that could happen, man. And that's the main reason I'm on your show. I see a lot of people come on your show. Like, I support everyone's channel. You know what I mean? I watch, you know, watch it and all that stuff. But I just felt like yours is more diverse. You bring more of a diverse um i don't know your guests are more diverse you know what i'm saying and that's why i hit you up about maybe trying to get a native on there man because yeah exactly the the youth need to hear this man i could how easy it is i couldn't have picked a better dude to bring on as a native i want to bring a native american on here i'd like to bring brothers on here african-american brothers hispanic brothers white brothers because i respect that man there's young black men going to jail man there's young white kids going to jail there's young natives out there on that reservation Bunch of natives are crips. I've seen it in prison. They're getting away. They're they're paving a way to prison, man. Involved in that gang life on the reservation, and they're living this life that they think they're cool. They think they're tough, and maybe they are, but it's it's really a brick wall at the end of the tunnel, man. And that brick wall is prison. And hopefully, we can try to help them kids, man. And maybe your story might make some of those young 12, 13, 14 year old Native American kids say, "Man, you know what? I don't want to be like Lee used to be. I want to be like how Lee is now." free living a good Appreciate life doing that, the right thing so i'm glad we were able to bring you on we're gonna i, I want to talk about the riot and, and the new charge so the odinists get into it with the native americans tell the people what prison and let's talk about it that was in uh that was in usp hazelton matter of fact is um the anniversary of that was just a you know three four days ago it happened on december 18th or december 16th 2008 um yeah it was kind of a snowball effect a lot of things led up to it it wasn't just like one incident um it started out there was these there's this new new group of dudes you know they all came from big sandy and i think they were all involved in the same incident um but right away you could see they were just trying to throw their weight around you know they thought there was big shit man and um our unit was real cool, real kickback, man. Everyone, everyone got along great. You know what I'm saying? You know, most of the shot callers was all in our block and it was real, real good unit. And, um, what happened at first was, uh, one of them went to commissary for our pipe carrier. He was in, he was in the block with me. Um, and when he was giving them his groceries, he grabs the big beef summer sausage and, holds it down, you know what I'm saying, between his legs like it's a dick and is waving it around and shit, you know what I mean? And my homie was like, hey, man, you know, I don't fucking play like that. What the fuck you doing shit like that in the day room for, you know what I'm saying? Like, we don't we don't fuck with each other like that, especially out here, you know what I'm saying? Like, you fucking did that shit in front of everybody. So uh, he apologized and shit, but um, it was not too long after that, I guess... um. They were mad because there was a white TV and a white table, right? And next to that table was like a table that was just for everybody. And um, like the natives used to play cards there and shit. We'd be gambling and sometimes we'd have black dudes over there. Sometimes, you know, we'd have anybody, you know what I'm saying? And I guess they felt some sort of way about that because it was too close to the table or something. But um, I guess they had a plan to try and take that table or whatever, lay claim to it. And um, one of the dudes, matter of fact, I was playing cards with him. He was a white dude. He let it slip that that was their plan. So, you know, I didn't say nothing at the time, but um, I let my bros know what was up. And, uh, you know, we went and confronted him right in the day room. And, you know, it was kind of a scene, you know, people made. And, um, but, you know, people got the gist of the situation and there was like every single car in the whole block kind of stood behind us and was like hey man don't be trying to bring that racist shit to the unit you know what i'm saying we all fucks with each other you guys want to bring that shit in here you know well all of us gonna fuck you up you know what i'm saying so there was that you know what i mean and then um this is all in a short period of time too 
then I had a Shelly. He had bought in a cell. And so before he left home, I moved in with him. He was white, but he had bought the cell. You know what I mean? And he was leaving it to me. So whenever he left, they tried to hit me up like, yo, that's a white cell. Um, we need that cell because fucking so-and-so needs a room. And I was like, yo, this ain't a white cell. He bought that. Like it was a personal, he didn't buy it for a white, he bought it for himself. And he left it to me, you know what I'm saying? So that's my cell. And um, they, t- they they kept trying to push the issue. You know, we we was trying to be diplomatic about it. You know, we went to Spike and shit like that. And um, I guess he tried to talk to him. And they said that, you know, Spike don't run shit. You don't fucking, he don't speak for us. You know what I'm saying? All that, you know, tough guy shit. And then pretty soon, like the next day, um, I got word that, Without me even knowing, without even me being in the unit, they went and put a cop out to the to the counselors about dude moving in my cell. And not only that, that he was moving on the bottom bunk as well. And I was like, man, you know, all this shit in a small amount of time, you know what I mean? I felt like they was just trying to save face for what happened in the day room about the table. So um Dude, they finally come up and talk to me about it because I confronted them about it and they admitted it. They was like, yeah, we did that. And uh, so I went and talked to my bros and shit, told them what was going on. Then I went back and talked to them and shit. And I was like, check it out, man. I said, we've been bumping heads ever since y'all got here. You know what I mean? Like we ain't never had problems with no white guys, nothing like that. This whole time we've been in this prison, man. Um, And I'm trying to keep it like that. So you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to be the bigger man. Fuck it. Move in. You can have the bottom bunk. You know what I mean? It is what it is. So he starts telling me like, yeah, man, that's cool. Thank you. You know, whenever I cook, you know, you get a bowl, all this shit and all that and all that. And I was like, all right, cool, man, whatever. I leave. I go tell my bros. I'm like, hey, dude's moving in with me tomorrow. And uh, be ready for that four o'clock count. I'm a butcher this motherfucker, man. Like I'm 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 sick of these dudes. They keep trying us. Be ready, because during count, I'm gonna fucking butcher this dude, man. And um, you know, I'm just rocking them to sleep. And um, the brothers is like, you talking about those same dudes? I was like, yeah, the same dudes. And I explained to them what all they did, putting the cop out in without even my, you know what I mean, without even my knowledge and shit. And they was like, fuck that, man. Let's just hit all the motherfuckers. I was like, hey, that's on you. I'm just telling you what, what I'm doing, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, my mind is made up. And um, they was like, yeah, let's hit all the motherfuckers. So the next morning, we snuck into the unit, you know, a couple at a time, one, two at a time. And, uh, you know, they was talking all that fucking shit about how they did this and did that over there and shit. And, man, we caught those dudes. They had fucking both headphones on. He- Feet kicked up on the fucking table, man. They were flipping, man. Like they weren't, they weren't ready, man. We bum rushed them, and man, it was, it was ugly, man. It was ugly. I damn sure thought at least one of them was dead after we did what we did, because we, we put it down pretty vicious on them, man. Like there was blood all over everything, all over everyone's door, every, the walls, everything. And um, there was a couple dudes that didn't make it into the unit. They were still in the hallway, so during the shit, one of the dudes is pounding on the door trying to get out, you know, and there's like three natives on him, stabbing him up in the back, and he's trying to shake the door. And they so they popped the door for him and then shut it real quick after he comes out. And he went out into the um to the hallway and they had him down, and then um he must have looked over and he seen one of my brothers, you know, wasn't no mistaking him, you know what I'm saying? He had Real long hair, bandana, you know, bigger, heavy set dude and stuff, man. And um, he must have thought he was going to get his get back on him. So he jumps up. He didn't know that there was four other dudes with him that were native, too. So he tried to get his get back and all them jumped up and started stabbing his ass again. <laughs> it was pretty crazy, man. But what yeah, were they, that's how that went down. Were they, man. Were they gang members, just Odinists? Uh, what gang did they run with? Um, the white as dudes? far as I know, they was just Odinists, man. Like one of them had some tattoos or some clothes release, but I I know he wasn't he wasn't 
he was no brand or nothing like that, man. Was Pooch they there? They call when him you were Lucky. There? I think he was just like supposed to be Irish or something like that. Was Pooch there when you were there? Yeah, yeah, I was there with Pooch. Matter Pooch. of fact, um, I had a celly from Pittsburgh. A white dude, man. I was I was selling these little white dudes for a while. Uh, Let me stop you. He was from Pittsburgh. He was involved in in jumping on Pooch Pooch. over there. Was it Brock? No, no. It was um, it was Aaron. But yeah, I know Brock. I was in the unit with all those dudes. You were there. You were there when Ricky Fackrell was there, right? In Hazleton, wasn't Ricky Fackrell involved? The sack dude, the dude I talked about in the other video. Um, remember he was not sure. One of them dudes. I don't recall him. One of them white gang dudes went hard with the independence against the brand and shit that when that had that right. Oh yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I know who you're talking about now. So that was Ricky I believe that was Ricky Fackrell, the kid that ended up killing, you know, two different people in prison. He's on death row now, man. Okay. Yeah, I was there when uh, that NLR dude Goose hit Chance too. I was in the shoe for that. They brought Chance out on a stretcher and shit. You remember Chance, huh? From Ohio. Ohio yep. A B. Had a Yep. They hit him for a reason, too. I was there through all that shit, man. Hazleton was, Hazleton was the most roughest yard I've ever seen in my life, man. It was it was vicious. So you end up getting charged based on this little riot between the natives and the whites, right? Yeah. What do they charge you with? Um, It was a nine-count indictment. I was on five of them. Um, they charged us with assault on... They charged me with assault on three different prisoners with a weapon and they charged me with possession of a weapon and they charged me with assaulting a CO with a weapon during the, I got charged with all that out of the nine counts. I got five of them. How much time did you end up copping out for them charges? All of us, all of us copped out to uh, 24 months consecutive. So you get in a riot, you stab the shit out of these dudes, right? I mean, your yeah. perspective is, hey, man, they were trying to play me. And, you know, you talked about, hey, I was going to rock them to sleep. So when you said, like, I was like, all right, I'm going to give you the cell. When you're saying it, I'm kind of like, damn, bro, you, you gave up that easy. But I didn't know you were about to tell me what you were going to do. So you rocked me yeah. to sleep, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I already had some time in by then, man. I couldn't go for that, man. Not, no doubt about that. But I want people to know that there is such a thing as rocking people to sleep in prison. And on that four o'clock count, when your mind is made up, you said, look, I'm butchering this dude. You got a knife. Maybe he don't have a knife. He thinks he's comfortable. He got the bottom bunk. Like, he, like you're a pushover now. And he saw, hey, I'm just going to give you some food and be, you know, passive. But really, I got you. He didn't even know what he was in store for, did he? Nah, he had no, he had no clue. And when you say butcher, right? I mean, I know what it is, but some of the viewers might not know. What do you mean by butchering him? Stab this shit. Out of them until, until I can't no more. <laughs> till he either gets away or the CO spray me or bomb me or whatever. You know, I've been in different prisons with a lot of natives, right? I was real good friends with a native dude when I was in USP Lee. And I tell people, man, that a lot of times I've seen the natives go hard on their own people, bro. Like, oh, bad, vicious. bad. We're really hard on each other. And I, and one of the most dangerous knives I ever seen in prison was one of your brothers, right? He was from Arizona. Well, I was real good friends with him. He's a phenomenal artist. His name was Casey. Dude, he had a knife made out of a deer antler, bro. And like he had saw like filed it down with the buffer machine in his cell. It was the baddest knife I ever seen in prison. You ever seen a knife like that? Yeah, I seen I seen it all. I, man, they used to call me the blacksmith. I kept all of my brothers strapped up because we were outnumbered, man. We were outnumbered so bad. I said the only way we got a chance is to have uh superior weaponry because we ain't got the numbers. So I used to make some vicious knives in there, man. I'm going to I'm gonna rewind you for a second. Then we're going to get to the SMU because I know people want to know about the SMU. I want to talk again right. about, a little bit about the murder. I want to go back to that. And I asked you if you were remorseful and you said, yeah, and I believe that, man. What was it like being 18 years old, charged with murder? You, you come from a good home, good parents, but you messed up. You made some bad choices. You're charged with murder. You're sitting in the county jail. Are you rubbing your head like, what did I do? Man, it it was it was hard, man. Chad shit. It was the hardest thing, man, to be that age and going through that, man. It was it was very, very hard, man, on on my psyche, man. It was yeah, it, it was a real strain, man. No question about that. Let me and um that's another thing I was gonna say is 
on the street. All I had ever done is uh, smoke weed and drink. You know, that was my thing. If I had drugs on me, it was because I was selling them. You know what I mean? Um, almost as soon as I got to prison, I started using drugs, man. Just to, just to cope, just to numb myself from, you know, what, what just happened. I felt like it was over with. You know, I'm only 18 and they gave me 15. That's basically my whole life. So I just felt like I didn't have shit to lose at that point. Let me ask you this. I'm going to ask you a man question. I'm going to... I'm going to start asking people this because I want people to tell the truth. This is a man question. I can tell you from personal experiences. What I'm going to ask you, I did as well. Did you ever break down and cry at 18 years old knowing you were facing the rest of your life possibly in prison? Absolutely. That's when all the tough guy stuff Absolutely, goes. Absolutely, man. I tell people that's when all the tough guy stuff goes out the window. When you're all alone and you're in your cell and you got that metal toilet and you got that shitty ass mirror that's not really a mirror and you look at it and you're looking back at yourself. And in your mind, you're saying, wow, man, what did I do? I'm facing 40 years. And I'm sure you were sitting in there looking in that mirror like, and that's the times, man, when you get in touch with yourself, man. And, and you know, the toughest of the tough sometimes break down, right? No question. Yeah, no question about that. So now I want people to understand that. I want the young men that are watching this show, I want you to know we got a guy right now, man, just killed three people. He killed someone, got got caught with a gun, went to prison, got out, killed somebody, got seven years for murder, got out, he was out six months, and he just killed two or three more people. And he's like 24, 25 years old. His life's over with, right? And I want people to see that, man. Don't be that young man that makes a choice that you're going to forever regret. Because when you when you take someone's life, man, it it's you're playing for keeps at that point for your own life. Because more than likely, you're going to jail. They're going to catch you more than likely. And then your mom yep, can't come okay. save you. Your dad can't come save you. 90% of the time, the best lawyer in your city can't get you out no matter how much money you pay them. And your life's pretty much over. It's shattered like broken glass, man. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a hard pill to swallow, man. I don't, I, don't wish it on, I don't wish it on anybody. And a lot of the times, you don't even, you don't even um, mean for it to wind up like that. You know what I'm saying? But... Just living that life, that's that's the risk you take for real every day. You know, you might not know it, but you are, man. Let me ask you this. When you're in prison, right, and you're about to stab these dudes, you're like, yo, we're about to put this work in. And in your mind, you're like, I'm putting this work in because there are some things in prison that you can't let go. And, you know, sometimes I actually got an email from a prosecutor today out of a certain state, right? And he says, hey, man, I really appreciate what you're doing. But prosecutors and judges might even be watching this show. And sometimes they don't understand, man, what it's like behind that wall that sometimes you're forced to do things that you don't want to do. But because it's prison and it's prison life, you have to because today they might steal your commissary. And if you let it go tomorrow, they might rape you, right? Right. Um, I could I could either, you know, stood up for myself or else I could have did, you know, 15 years being a victim, you know what I mean? And I just, I just, I couldn't do that. You know what I mean? I couldn't do that, man. What does it feel but, like? But some, some, some people, people do choose, choose that. that. And I, and I really, really feel sorry for them, man, because, um, and it ain't, it ain't no life to live, man, man, prison in general, but then I have to be in PC, man. That's, that's like, I don't even call it living, man. I just call it an existence, man. Cause just like you said, I used to look around and be like, man, this is this is what my life is, man. You know what I mean? And I don't even call it living life. It's just existed, man. It's just an existence. It's a sad reality. So when you get ready to go stab these dudes, you got to do what you got to do. But how do you feel inside? Is your heart pounding? Is your adrenaline going? Are you excited? Are you nervous? What goes into that? Absolutely. Um, yeah, all that stuff, man. My adrenaline's going, but... You know, someone looking at me would think that I'm just, I'm looking at you probably just like I'm looking at you right now in this camera. You know what I mean? You can't show it. You can't never show your hand in there. But yeah, no, no question. question. You're, You're scared because you don't know. know. Just like, like you said, you might kill someone or you might get killed. You know what I mean? You know, just fortunately, you know, for me anyways, we came out on the winning side that day. And sometimes it doesn't always work out that way, right? Oh, absolutely not. So let's talk about the SMOO program. 
You end up going to what's called the special management unit after this stabbing, right? Yeah. Let's talk about that. Tell the people about the special management unit and how it how it feels to be locked in a cell 23, 24 hours a day, not to be able to call your family because whatever young man is watching this, I want I don't want him to think that prison is like his county jail. Talk about the smooth program. Man, the smooth program um I was locked down from 2008 from the time of that incident to 2012. Um Two months shy of 48 months, 46 months straight, I was in lockdown, man. Um, every single day, I'm in a little tiny cell. And just like you say on your show, like, it could be your best friend in the world. But pretty soon, every little thing just starts to eat at you. You know what I mean? I've gotten into fights with my closest friend that I had in prison. You know, we ended up being cool afterwards, but we got into a fight in the shoes just because... We got sick of each other, man. You just can't be like that, you know, with another man just all day, all night. You know what I'm saying? It's just natural. Humans just need a little space, you know. And, you know, every time you come out, you're handcuffed behind your back. You know, some places have showers. Some places don't. Three times a week, they bring you to a shower. Handcuffed behind your back. Tackles sometimes, too. Um, Bring you back the same way. Uh, I had a three-man hold on me, so I had to have three staff every time I went somewhere. Um, I mentioned it, too. Um, during my smooth program bit, uh, I ended up filing a lawsuit on them myself. You know what I mean? I went pro se and filed a lawsuit in court, um, and I had absolutely no question about anything about law, but I just figured it out on my own. You know, I'm sitting in the hole all day, so... But yeah, I, I was beaten by a CO while I was handcuffed behind my back. They ended up paying me a couple of dollars for that. And it, it, it's, it's scary. You know, these are the guys that are supposed to be protecting me. If, if my life is on the line, they're, they're the ones supposed to protect me. And, you know, I'm, I was at his mercy. You know what I mean? When you're cuffed behind your back, you're just at another man's mercy. You just got to hope that he don't feel like killing you, you know, because they could easily. No problem. So the cop ends up, what, beating you up? What did he do? Did he kick you in the face when you were on the ground? Did he knock you down? Did he throw you down the stairs? What happened? Um, He punched me up in the face. Um, What had happened was um, he was talking slick to me through the door. And I, I you know what, in there, man, you're, you're just so irritated because, man, everything that you need or do, you have to depend on someone else. You know, you're at the mercy of, of COs, man, because they're the ones that have to bring everything to you. So when you ask for something, man, it's just, I don't know, sometimes they're in fucked up moods and they, you know, they just talk any old fucking way to you, man. And, you know, I was in a bad mood that day. So I told him, hey, man, um, we, we got the showers today. I said, you take me out for the shower. And when you put the cuffs on me, you put them on loose. I said, I'll come up out of them. And you know, back up your motherfucking mouth, you know, you want to talk all that shit. They see you back it up. I'll get in trouble. You won't. And uh, sure enough, he came to uncuff me or he came to cuff me up. So I was like, OK, you know, I thought, thought he was about something. I put my hands out the slot and he put those motherfuckers on so goddamn tight, man. My man, my hands went numb. So uh, going back to the cell, I told him, I was like, yeah, you don't, you know, what I mean talking all that shit but you ain't trying to see me for real you know what i mean you know i pull, I pull this card and uh you know i called him a bitch and shit and you know he went out like a bitch he started punching me while i was handcuffed real live sucker did anybody intervene any other cops say hey man that's enough or anything like that it, it took him a minute but yeah he lose his job uh you know they don't tell you that stuff they don't tell you that stuff so you end up spending four years in the smooth program, locked in a cell, man. Do you think it destroyed you a little bit mentally? No question about it. I had I had PTSD, man, just just from being around all the violence in general in prison. But definitely that incident I just explained had a lot to do with it, because that's what that's when I knew I'm in here completely alone. These guys are not, you know, if something goes down, I cannot count on these guys to help me. 
they're the ones trying to hurt me. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it, it definitely fucked me up in the head. So how much time were you supposed to be in the smoo after the stabbing? Um, I was in the shoe for a year going through court, you know what I mean? And then um, once we got sentenced, that's when they sent us to SMU, and that was supposed to be an 18-month program. And I turned it into a three-year program. Matter of fact, I never really completed it. After that incident, I told you I was on still on level one, and I had been in there three years or almost three years. I was still on level one because I kept getting into it with the staff, you know, and um, what happened? Yeah, I was in there for three years. Um, I just lost my train of thought. You're all right. Let me bring you back then. It's my job to bring you back, right? So you spent, yeah. all, this, you spent all this time in the smooth program. The cop jumps on you. He beats you up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now I remember. Yep. I was only on level one. And after that, you know, just to get me out of the prison, they shoot, they shot me to Allenwood and Allenwood was only for level three and level four. So that's for like when you're supposed to be getting ready to leave the smooth program. And I was really supposed to still be on level one, but they sent me to Allenwood. Allenwood's looking at my paperwork like, what the fuck? Why did they send you here, man? You know, I just got a shot. They gave me an assault for that. For that cop beating me up, they gave me an assault for that. So um, he was like, I don't understand why you're here. He's like, but fuck it, you're here, man. You know, as long as you give us the time, you don't give my officers a hard time. Because I had a gang of staff assaults by then. Um, he was just like, you don't give my staff a hard time, we'll let you out. So that's the only reason I made it through the program. Did you ever think you were never going to get out of prison? Was there ever a time where you were like, man, fuck it, my life's over, man. I fucked my whole life off, man. I'm fighting the yes. cops. They're probably going to charge me with that. I already got this other charge. Tell me about it. Yeah, I definitely did. Um, when I was in the SMU, I thought I was going to I was gonna do my whole rest of my time in the SMU, you know, because I just kept, you know, I couldn't make it. I couldn't make it through them phases because... Because the COs were just such assholes, man. You know what I mean? They torment you on top of, you know, being locked down all day. You're getting tormented and, you know, like like poking a hornet's nest. Yeah. Being locked in that cell. And also, I never thought, I'd, yeah, whenever whenever we did that in that riot, um, after I seen how much damage we did, and I, I definitely thought that I was going to get at least about 12 more years added on to my sentence. So when they said 24 months, we jumped on it because uh, the the staff was pushing for attempted homicide. Thank God that it didn't work out that way. So now I see your home. I see you're free. I see the Minnesota Viking stuff behind you. How long you been oh, out? Yeah. I've been on four and a half years. Um, I got five years of supervised release. A lot of people get three. They gave me five. Yeah, so um, I've got six months left. I've been on four and a half years, and I'm just trying to knock this last six months out, man. That's what's up, man. I'm happy for you. It's good to be free, right? What are you, are you working? You got kids now? Um, Yeah, I, I, I'm working here and there. I don't got like a nine to five, but I do carpentry. I was actually in school for it when the COVID hit, and I, uh, you know, I, 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 told him that I'd be back when the campus is open back up. Cause that's, you know, that's a hands-on type thing, but I still do carpentry work. You know, I get, you know, I get contracts here and there. And also, um, um, a couple of my buddies, they own like, a, um, like a transit type service. They, they give people rides like to the hospitals and the meetings and stuff like that. And, um, you know, they got houses up, up North, where I live, northern Minnesota, and they got houses down in um, the cities, Minneapolis, which is like four hours away. Um, I keep their houses clean, and I detail their vehicles that they use for driving and transporting people, too. And I do the carpentry stuff, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing all right. I ain't hurting for money. Let me ask you this. You got any kids? You start a family, girlfriend, wife? No, I don't. No, I don't. And I'm, and I'm glad I didn't have them before I went, either, because, you know, what that I, I feel like that would have been unfair to them. You know what I mean? For sure. I understand yeah, I got that. out. My old lady right now, she has her tubes tied. So 
you know, but that ain't really, that ain't really something that, you know, that I've ever been really, you know, thirsty for or nothing like that. You know what I mean? So it don't really bother me at all. Got to do what makes Lee happy. If that's not what you want, that's not what you want. Maybe you got a different purpose, exactly. a different gig. Exactly. You know? Freedom's what makes Lee happy. <laughs> no doubt. I want to ask you a couple more things, man. It's Christmas time. You're home. You're with your family. How's it feel? Man, it feels great. It feels great, man. What's Christmas? Just, you know, like like your other guests say, just to be able to, man, just freedom is so so awesome, man. You know, you value that shit when it's taken from you. Family, you value that shit when it's taken from you. You know, yourself. You know what I mean? That's that. That's one of the messages I want to get across to the youth. Value yourself. I didn't start valuing my myself until everything was taken from me, and I hope that I could, you know, maybe with this. You know, have them maybe start valuing themselves before they have to go through what I went through. You know what I mean? But yeah, life is lovely, man. I, I love being able to do whatever I want. I got my own place, you know, first time I ever had my own place. You know, I've been having a few cars since I've been. I got my license for the first time. I never had a job until 34 years old when I got out. got my first job. I told you I've been to college now since I've been out, man. It is it's great, man. So much better, man. You went in as a young man. You experienced a lot of things. Tell the people what Christmas is like sitting in the smooth program, locked in a cell. What's Christmas like? What's the food like on Christmas? You happy when it comes? Man, you're happy when it comes because it's a little better than what you usually get. But Christmas is just another another day, man. Another day on the calendar. You know, they, there ain't nothing special going on in there, man. It's just another day on the calendar and just... It's even worse because it's more miserable because you're, you know, that's when you start thinking about your family and everything that you fucked off being in there. You know, before we get ready to close, you know, I want people to know, man, that you went in there at 18 years old, came home at what, 34 years old. You've mm -hmm. been in some things where you could have lost your life. You've been in some things where you could have died in prison or you could have killed someone in prison and you could have been on death row like Kramer, the guy you used to work out with or Ricky Fakro. You could have been over there, man. And let me, let, me, let me let me stop you right there. I want to tell you something. Um, I got released from USP Pollock in Louisiana. And, you know, as a lot of people know, um, like for violence, all around violence, it might not be the top prison, but for murders, it probably is. Um, but uh, four months to the door, um, there was a situation. We're on lockdown and one of my brothers was trying to uh, get some K2 from, from, from a Mexican dude. And I don't know if he was, I think he was drinking or something, but dude told him like, no, nah, I can't do it. You already got a bill. And I guess he must've said something sideways on his mouth thinking the dude wasn't hearing him. So they came out for showers and it pops off. The dude that, that said the remark, he ended up getting paralyzed, stabbed in his spine. The other, his, the, the Mexican cell, he jumped on another one of my brothers um, and he started trying to stab him. But my bro knocked his ass out, took his knife from him and started stabbing him. So it's like they got one of ours and we got one of theirs. And uh, this is four months to the door. All that shit's all, you know, boom, I'm still in the unit. I don't know what the fuck happened. I just, you know what I mean? I'm like, fuck, I'm almost home, man. Then one day we're coming out for showers. I look outside, they only let one orderly out. Well, that one orderly is the dude's homies, the Mexican dude's homies. I already know what time it is. So I tell my celly like, hey dude, you better strap up when we go out there. He's like, nah, man, I fuck with Flacco, man. I'm gonna go holler at him, see what the fuck was going on, man. Me and him's cool. Man, we go out there, as soon as we go out there, Dude rushes my cell. He tries to, you know, pulls out a knife, starts trying to get him. He left his in, in the room, you know, even though I told him to bring it. He left his in the room. I had mine. This is four months to the door. Me and dude are slinging knives at each other. Thank God that uh, I didn't hit him. He didn't hit me. They came in, sprayed us, shot us down and shit. And uh, that's that's what happened four months to the door. I told my cell, I was like, don't ever gamble with your life, dude. Don't ever gamble with your life. You know what I mean? But yeah, that happened to me four months to the door. That's what happened in those fucking places. Man, Lee, you've been through it, man. For real. You've probably been through more 
than anyone else that I brought on. And, you know, for people that have been to prison, federal prison, they know that what you're talking about is real. Some people yeah. might leave some comments on here, but, oh, oh, oh. but I know, I, I believe you 100%. I believe you, man. You've been through it. I'm just glad that you're Oh yeah. There's a whole lot of stories that we didn't, we didn't get to, man. We'd be here all day. I'm telling you, I, I had a rough ride, man. I wouldn't wish it on nobody. Cause it's, it, you know what I mean? It, it still fucks in my head to this day, man. You know, I wouldn't wish a, it on nobody, but unfortunately it's true. We're going to probably do a part two. I'm sure people are going to want to hear from you again. And, uh, you know, I just want to tell you, man, that I appreciate you. You know, I appreciate you coming on the show. Anything I appreciate you, you, man. Well, thank you, bro. Any last words you want to say to the people before we go? Yeah, man. Um, especially to the youth, like I said, man, my biggest message is, is man, value yourself, man. You know what I mean? Your life is worth something. Don't, don't, don't fuck it off, man. I had to get everything taken from me before I finally seen the value of my life, of my freedom, of my family. Man, don't, don't do it the hard way like I did, man. You know, um, I was in the exact same streets that you guys are in, man, doing the same shit you guys are doing, man. I'm living proof that it could happen to you, man. And um, ain't nothing sweet in there. You know, the shit that you hear, it ain't just gang members that have to go through that. We got to go through all that shit, too. We got to go through all the same rules. Be up, be suited, be booted, be ready, holding security in the showers. You know what I mean? All that shit. We got, we got, you know, mandatory workouts if you're a certain age. All that shit. Just because we ain't a gang, we got to function. We got to get down with the program because that's where we're at, man. Even if you don't want to tote a knife, you have to because everyone else is. And you don't want to be the only one without one, man. The shit is real in there, man. And I wouldn't wish it on none of you guys. That's why I'm coming on this, this program, man. I pray to God, pray to the creator that no one ever has to go through what I went through, man. No doubt, man. I'm going to close the show and just tell you, man, I got nothing but love and respect for you, bro, and I appreciate you coming on. So I'm going to close yeah, the show. Yeah, appreciate it, man. We're going to do a part two, man. Blood on the razor wire with respect. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, share the video, leave a comment. I'm sure this brother will get back with you on comments as well. Until tomorrow, with respect, we're out. Thank <laughs> you.